and welcome to Science View, where we cover the latest advances in Japanese science and technology. I'm your navigator, Tomoko Kimura. Today, we've left our studio and are in Tsukuba City, which is Japan's leading science city. Over the next two programs, we'll visit different research institutes and take a look at their latest research. And on the show for the very first time is our science watcher, Dr. Mizuki Oka, an associate professor at the University of Tsukuba. Hello. I'm happy to be here. I specialize in the field of web science. The information that is available on the internet or web is drastically changing our everyday lives. Web science is a scientific study of the different phenomena that it causes. I'm glad to have you here as part of our show. My father was a researcher at an institute here, so this is my hometown, and I look forward to introducing the latest research that is taking place here. Actually, there is another person with close ties to Tsukuba. Michelle? Hi, I'm Michelle. Tsukuba City is a very special place to me because this is where I used to live and went to university. Today, I'll introduce you to the cutting-edge research found here in Tsukuba. We look forward to your report. But first, let's take a look at an overview of Tsukuba Science City. The city of Tsukuba is located approximately 50 kilometers northeast of Tokyo. It has a population of about 220,000 people, being a research and academic center about 36,000 or one in six people are employed by research institutes. Construction of the city began in 1963, a government initiative the city was designed to promote the development of scientific technology and education. By 1980, many research institutes had been constructed in the city. It gained prominence in 1985 when it hosted the International Exposition. Cutting-edge technologies of the time such as robot technologies and imaging technologies were displayed over a period of six months and the event received approximately 20 million visitors. The city is currently home to over 300 government and civilian research facilities, where research is being held on everything from space to industrial technology, natural science, agriculture, and more. So the entire city is essentially one big research center. And a science city indeed. Here is a sign that says Robot Zone. Dr. Oka, what does this mean? Tsukuba City is actively promoting the Robot City project, where various experiments and studies are being held, with the goal of creating society in which humans and robots can live together. It's jointly supported by the government, universities, research institutes, and local businesses. I see. And the sign says that robots pass through here. So this is where various robot experiments actually take place. So the theme of today's program, the first of our two-part series on Scuba Science City, is robot technology. We'll take a look at the front lines of development. A special bus was prepared for the team's tour of Tsukuba Science City. So what's our first destination? It's the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, or AIST for short. It's a government research organization that conducts research on a wide range of industrial technologies, including robotics. The AIST is one of the largest public research organizations in Japan. It was formed in 2001 by 15 research institutes that belong to the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. Their research covers a vast range of subjects, including technologies for hydrogen and renewable energy sources like wind and solar sunlight, and the development of new resources and materials like bendable electronic circuits and flexible electronics. Research is also being conducted on medical technologies, which include the early diagnosis of diseases and regenerative medicine, and life technologies, which include designing industrial products for greater child safety. The Institute is also conducting geological surveys and research on standard units of weight, 
length, time, and more. Many practical technologies were also created by the Institute. New electronic technologies like Spintronics have increased hard drive storage space and reduced power consumption. An efficient method for creating carbon nanotube was also developed. And one research field that the AIST has focused on over the years is robot development. Dr. Kotaro Oba from the AIST's Robot Innovation Research Center is here to show us around. Thank you very much for your time. Nice to meet you. This is HRP2P. It's a biped human robot prototype. It's designed to access areas that are dangerous or difficult for people to enter. For example, disaster sites. I heard that very complicated control technology is needed for a robot to walk on two legs. We've been developing this type of robot since 2000. So all of the components, the sensors, drive units, and computers have been upgraded. I think it's safe to say that it can almost work like a human. The newest HRP4C was made to be as human-like as possible and has a realistic female face. The neck and back moves like a human being. It's expected to be used at exhibitions and fashion shows. There are other robots as well. This is Paro, a seal-shaped robot. It's equipped with the latest technology, including an artificial intelligence and responds to touch and speech. It's a therapeutic robot and is used to provide psychological care at nursing homes and other facilities. This is a general-purpose humanoid robot. In the field of life science, it can perform experiment tasks. By leaving the simple tasks to robots, the people can focus on the creative work. We've seen how this research institute develops many different types of robots. Do you have a research strategy that you are implementing? To sum it up simply, it will be to create automated machines with functions that benefit people. To do this, we are creating shapes that match the purpose and also advancing research on the robot control, artificial intelligence, recognition functions, and more. There's actually an institute where you can watch a robot in action. Would you like to see it? Yes, we'd love to. The ceiling is so high. And there we see a humanoid robot. Dr. Kanehiro is an expert on humanoid robots. He will explain this area. Welcome. Is this set modeled after a disaster site? Yes. The mission of this robot is climb up these stairs and rotate that valve over there. So this is a modified version of the robot user area, HLP2. So it has enhanced parts. So it has 32 servo motors throughout its body, and they move the robot's arms and legs. Why was it shaking its head in front of the stairs? Uh, it's using the laser range sensors in its head to collect the data on its surroundings. So it will use the data to calculate the path, how to place foot, footprints. It's carefully climbing up the stairs. So now it's turning the valve with its hands. It's turning the valve with both hands like a human. Ah, you have a good eye. So it was actually easier to have it put its fingers in the valve and turn it but we decided to have it move like a human. Uh, this is because most valves are very heavy and the human method lets to put more power into the movement. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanehiro, for showing us the robot in action. By the way, Dr. Oba, there was a sign outside that said robots can pass through. Was the sign referring to humanoid robots like this one? 
No, they're more practical and uh, for daily use. Let's have our reporter Michelle get the details on it. Michelle? Hi, Tomoko. I'm at a promenade in the middle of the city having a great time riding this two-wheeled vehicle. And I heard that there's supposed to be a, a robot that's supposed to pass by here. That's an unusual looking wheelchair. <laughs> an electric wheelchair passed right in front of me. And it steered around me and the person on it didn't seem to be operating it. Could that be a robot? Let's go and ask. This is Dr. Osamu Matsumoto. He is a robotics researcher. Is this a robot? Yes, this is called a mobility robot, and it's designed to transport people. Information on its surroundings is gathered by sensors. A computer processes it and controls the motor. It's classified as a robot. The two-wheeled standing vehicle that I was riding is also a mobility robot, and it has a self-balancing function. These mobility robots are the ones that the signs throughout town were referring to. Robots like these are normally prohibited on public roads in Japan. The city of Tsukuba received special permission to create a mobility robot experimental zone. Matsumoto has held numerous personal mobility robot tests on these roads. This is Matsumoto's laboratory. There are many wheelchairs here. Matsumoto's goal is to provide people with physical disabilities with a safe transportation method. To do this, he is developing a wheelchair with an automatic driving system. However, this is said to be harder than designing one for cars. Wheelchairs have to be able to handle different settings. For example, parks where trees grow or inside buildings. Their driving environment is very different from cars and more complicated. Obstacles present another challenge. Cars are limited to roads, so they mainly have to be careful for other vehicles. Wheelchairs, on the other hand, have to avoid people who jump into the way or objects around them. Matsumoto set his sight on a device called a laser distance sensor. It uses a laser beam to detect what is in the direction ahead. It was originally only able to work in one direction, but by adding a turning function, the sensor can now take measurements in all directions. A three-dimensional map is created with the information and is used to assess the situation. We were shown its performance. We took the wheelchair down to the main lobby of the building and had the laser distance sensor measure it. This is the image created by the sensor. The pillars and the bench can be seen distinctly. It may look like a still image, but the sensor is actually measuring its surroundings in real time. Here's the proof. Oh, something red appeared on screen. It's a person. That's right. The red mark is a person passing in front of the wheelchair. The sensor accurately captures their movements. A program that will use the data to improve the wheelchair's driving is currently being developed. The blue line is the wheelchair's planned route. But when a person appeared on screen, the route became more roundabout. It immediately calculated the quickest way to get back onto its original course. I decided to participate in an experiment to test its function. Oh! Incredible! This is the data that the wheelchair acquired. It instantly charted a detour to avoid a collision and passed safely by me. Next, let's try the same experiment with more people. As you see, it moves very smoothly. It is programmed to maintain a set speed 
and as much as possible avoid people without stopping. Many senior citizens have difficulty walking and as a result stay cooped up in their homes. With this, they don't have to walk and can safely go out anywhere they want. By incorporating these into society, we could raise the quality of life. And that's what I'm hoping to achieve. Those mobility robots are very clever. Yes. And as you can imagine, safety features are needed for the passenger safety. The facility we are in now tests the safety of the robots. It's the Robot Safety Center. There are other tests too. For example, whether it's safe to run on a slanted floor, what happens in a collision with another person, or whether a strong electric wave in an electrically shielded room would cause the robot to malfunction, and more. 18 test devices are used to gauge their safety. Once a robot's safety standards have been proven by a certification body, the company can confidently send its products out into the world. Do other countries have safety verification systems like this in place? Japan was one of the first in the world to set it up. If we can establish a safety standard that protects people, then it could act as a springboard for the application of robots in the real world. That's what this robot safety center was built for. So different types of robots will pass through this facility before going out into the world. I look forward to seeing how robots will enhance society. Yes, Dr. Oba, thank you very much for showing us around. So, from what we've seen, SCUBA seems to be steadily working towards integrating robots into society. Yes, at AIST, we saw how robots are becoming close to playing a part in our lives. Now let's take a look at robot technology that would be used far, far away. The bus's next stop was the Tsukuba Space Center of JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. JAXA is a national agency that plays a central role in Japan's space development. One project that JAXA is pushing forward is the space experiments held aboard Kibo, the Japanese experiment module at the International Space Station. The experiments and studies that are held in space's unique environment are expected to contribute to the progress of the medical field, industrial technology, and more. Japan's various space technologies were used to produce the H2 transfer vehicle, Kono Tori, it delivers vital supplies to the International Space Station and the method used to dock it to the station was developed by Japan. JAXA is also involved in the development and management of satellites, including Earth Observing Satellites. Advanced Land Observing Satellite 2, Daichi 2, observes uplifts near volcanic craters and crustal movement caused by earthquakes and swiftly relays information in times of disaster. Satellite acquired data is also used to address global problems such as climate change. This is JAXA's exhibition hall, the Space Dome. Wow, this is very cool. Mr. Masaru Wada from JAXA's Human Space Systems and Utilization Mission Directorate will be our guide here. Welcome to Tsukuba Space Center. Thank you for having us. Speaking of human space systems, Japanese astronaut Takuya Onishi recently began his long-stay mission aboard the International Space Station. Yes, actually, uh, this is a full-scale mock-up of Japanese experiment module Kibo and astronaut Onishi is working in this module. He will be supporting various missions, uh, such as uh, protein cell generation or material combustion. And also, uh, we hope he has a chance to capture this co-notary uh, by ISS robotic arm. And what is this part attached on the outside? Yes, uh, this is uh, what we call Japanese exposed facility. 
This is used for various space exposed mission. And this exposed facility has a 10 attaching port, which is used for each space experiment unit. Space environment is uh, actually pretty harsh. As you know, there are almost zero gravity and vacuum, and our thermal temperature is uh, pretty extreme, from minus 100 degrees Celsius up to plus 100 degrees Celsius. With this environment, we can use this exposed facility to conduct a various space exposed mission, such as a material exposure to space. So you can hold various experiments that would be very difficult to conduct on Earth. Yes, and do you know what robot is actually working in Kibo? The only robot I can see is the robotic arm. That's correct. This Kibo robotic arm is Japan's first practical space robot. This robotic arm comprised of two robotic arms. The one is uh, this long robotic arm, what we call main arm. Main arm is uh, 10 meter long and has six joints, and it can handle more than two tons of payload. And the other robotic arm is, although you cannot see in this mock-up, uh, what we call small fine arm. Small fine arm has also six joints, and it is used for fine robotics tasks. Is Onishi operating the robotic arm? No, actually, we are doing by ourselves. Really, you are? Yes, uh, we have been operating this robotic arm since 2013, and one reason for ground control is reduce the workload of astronauts. Since the astronauts' time in space is limited, that is an effective method. Yes, uh, thanks to the ground control of robotics arm, so astronauts can now use their time on other experiments. Are there any future plans for the robotic arm? Yes, we are developing a more advanced robotic arm, moving like human arms, and we are trying to incorporate uh, cutting-edge robotics technology uh, such as uh, autonomous control into the new robotic arm. That's our future plan. We look forward to your success. Mr. Wada, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Tomoko, before we go, I'd like to show you an interesting space robot that they have. The two headed to the Research and Development Directorate, which conducts basic research for aerospace engineering. Hello. Hello. Welcome. The two were greeted by Dr. Shinji Mitani, an expert on satellite attitude control technology. We were told that we could see an interesting space robot here. Yes, this is it. This cube packed with machines? Please watch this. Wow, how does it get up? When a wheel is rotated, force can be generated in the opposite direction in which the wheel is spinning. The cube is able to get up by taking advantage of this principle. The reactive force that results from the sudden stop of the rotating wheels is strong enough to propel the cube into that position. It's standing on its corner. Can I touch it? The cube is standing on one corner, and it doesn't fall over when nudged. So this is a robot? It's a robot type equipped with a satellite's attitude control technology. Satellites and explorers use robot technology to control their attitude in space. First, they use sensors to assess their location in relation to the sun and constellations. 
Then a control program automatically calculates the X, Y, Z coordinate axes and determines the direction. The standard method for attitude control is to use the reaction of three wheels housed in the cube. When the disc-shaped wheels are rotated, force can be generated in the opposite direction of the wheel's spin as a reaction. Attached in three different directions, the wheels can be used to freely control the attitude. This cube-shaped robot has three wheels that respond to the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis, respectively. Sensors are embedded into six of the eight vertices, and the wheel's rotation is adjusted according to the centrifugal force and acceleration detected by the sensors. What's the reason behind its cubic shape? Attitude control components make up 10% of a satellite's bulk so we're trying to make them as compact and light as possible. The wheels and sensors in a satellite normally have their own box, but we wondered if we couldn't combine them all into one box. So if all the functions are assembled together, then even if it breaks, you could send a robot to replace it. Exactly. We are still in the experimental stage, but if it's realized, then it could raise the efficiency of satellites. Dr. Mitani, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Today we visited different research institutes in Scuba Science City and focused on robot technology. Dr. Oka, how would you wrap up today's tour? To sum it up, robots come in all shapes and sizes according to their purpose. But what they all have in common is that they exist to assist humans and behind their production are the hopes and efforts of many researchers and cutting-edge technology. Tsukuba has called itself a robot city and it certainly lives up to its name. Here you can interact with robots at the Research Institute's exhibition spaces and I highly recommend a visit. Thank you, Dr. Oka. And thank you for joining us. We hope you join us again for the second part here on Scuba Science City. See you next time on Science View.